Yeah, so today I'm going to talk about homomorphic encryption. This is what I've been working on on the last three months, I guess. And I'm, I've just recently started to look into how homomorphic encryption can be applied to the blockchain. Um, this is a like a summary of what I've been uh, what I will talk about. So it's, the talk will be basically split into parts. First, I'm going to talk a little bit about homomorphic encryption, and then we I want to go through a simple example on how homomorphic encryption is uh, applied to the blockchain, and hopefully manage to convey the, the basic idea, which is is really simple. So what is homomorphic encryption? Uh, in short, uh, it's basically a kind of encryption that uh, lets you compute directly on the encrypted data. So ideally, we would like to be able to apply any functionality F on some ciphertext that encrypts the message X and get an encryption of F of X. This is what we would like. Um, and why why do we care about this kind of encryption? Well, uh, think about uh, the situation when you're searching on Google. Uh, everything that you type in Google, basically Google knows. So your privacy is zero, but you get to benefit uh, from the functionality. And if you type encrypted stuff on Google, you don't benefit uh, from the functionality. So basically, this is a kind of technology that lets you uh, have the best from the both worlds, so to speak. So it's a good balance between privacy and functionality. Uh, and yeah, there are other technologies that basically have the same goal, like zero knowledge proofs maybe functional encryption and <laughs> encryption. Uh, to give a simple example, uh, I hope you're all familiar with the RSA encrypt public encryption scheme, uh, in which you have a large modulus N and the public key is basically a, an exponent E and to encrypt, you just raise the message to the power E mod N. And because multiplication is homomorphic with respect to uh, raising powers, uh, it, it's easy to check that this scheme is homomorphic with respect to one operation, just multiplication more than. There are other schemes that are homomorphic with respect to only one operation, like El Gamal or Paye encryption schemes. And we call such scheme partially homomorphic when it's homomorphic with respect to only one operation. Uh, we would like our encryption schemes to be homomorphic with respect to, to operations, as we will see later. But it's a good example to uh, get a feeling for, for this really good. Um, in maybe more detail, I, I would like to discuss yeah, uh, this example, which you can fully see on the, on the screen. Basically, a homomorphic encryption scheme is a public key encryption scheme, if you want to think about it like that, uh, which is specified by the key generation algorithm, encryption and decryption, just like the regular public key encryption scheme, but homomorphic encryption uh, has an extra feature, has an, uh, another algorithm that lets you evaluate publicly on the ciphertext. Uh, so, uh, consider the following exam example where Alice uh, holds a piece of private sensitive data like her DNA. Uh, she has it somehow on her laptop and she would like to uh, run or to run this a DNA test uh, in the cloud. Or uh, th There is a service online that predicts the risk of having some disease based on the or, 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 or based on your genetic code. Uh, obviously, she can directly send the DNA to the cloud and get the result back, but 
not sure if you would like to do that with your DNA because, uh, yeah, for obvious reasons, at least obvious for me. Um, and homomorphic encryption kind of gives a solution to this problem. Uh, Alice can generate a key pair uh, for homomorphic uh, encryption and then encrypt her DNA uh, with a public key and send this encrypted data to, to the cloud. And then because of the homomorphic properties of the scheme, the cloud can publicly evaluate on this encrypted data. And this, uh, this evaluation reflects on the, on the encrypted data. And this encrypted result is sent back to Alice. And uh, because Alice has the secret decryption keys, she can decrypt the result. And in this way, she can learn how to dispose this she is to a specific disease. And the key, key points here are that Alice is always in control of her private data. So once the, uh, she encrypts her data and sends it into the wild, she doesn't care because the data is always encrypted. Uh, another important feature is that the computation or the evaluation is done without the knowledge of the secret key. So the data is never decrypted in this uh, computation pro computational process. And only Alice learns the result because she's the only one who has the secret key. As you can imagine, there can be a lot of use cases. Uh, for instance, as I mentioned, the last two are very similar with the Google search. For instance, maybe crime investigations want to check a database, but we want to do it privately and so on. I, I won't uh, get into the details. <laughs> So this seems like a really cool technology that seems to be solving all our privacy privacy issues. Uh, is this the case? Uh, the short answer is maybe for some specific applications because uh, this technology can be quite expensive computationally. So for some specific applications, uh, you can do it. Um, uh, there has been, so, so the first theoretical solution has been proposed in 2009 and the cryptographic community, uh, was really engaged with this topic and, uh, there has been a lot of work in this area and all these efforts has been crystallized in some publicly available homomorphic encryption, uh, libraries like Elip, DFHE or Microsoft CL or Zamas Concrete. Um, and I'll try to give you a sense of, of why this uh, wh why this technology might be computation, computationally expensive. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, what uh, what the evaluate what the eval algorithm actually does is express the functionality that you wish to evaluate as a binary circuit, and the scheme is actually homomorphic with respect to two operations, like some kind of addition and some kind of multiplication. Uh, either addition and multiplication on integers, or you can think about uh, XOR and multiplication of bits and so on. Uh, so if you have a scheme that is able to evaluate addition and multiplication, in theory, you can evaluate homomorphically any kind of functionality and for why is this the case you can think of the binary case you can express any boolean function basically as using just xors and multiplication so if you have a fun if you have homomorphic encryption that works for this uh, for these two operations then in theory you can evaluate anything but uh, the problem is that in practice all the the most efficient schemes for doing homomorphic encryption are lattice-based. And what uh, lattice-based cryptography does is actually uh, hide or have some noise in the ciphertext. And this noise is necessary for security. Basically, this noise 
smudges or however you, you like to think of this, the, the plain text in some sense. And the problem is that we, if you have this noise around, when you do operations on ciphertext, this noise grows. And at some point, it will grow uh, so large that it will be impossible to decrypt because it smudges all the important information contained in the ciphertext. So basically, the number of operations is limited uh, for such a scheme. And we call such a scheme where the numbers of, of operations uh, are limited as somewhat homomorphic encryption. And uh, the thing is that you have to set the parameters in advance. So you uh, pick a number of operations that you want to do, and then you set the parameters accordingly. So because of this, the parameters can get huge if you want to do i don't know like 30 multiplications or something like that uh, and we have another flavor of homomorphic encryption which is called fully homomorphic encryption and this type of homomorphic the homomorphic encryption supports unlimited number of operations with the same set of parameters and you and this can be achieved starting with a somehow homomorphic or somewhat homomorphic encryption scheme and applying something that is called bootstrapping and this bootstrapping it's uh, kind of like a, a public operation so anyone can do it on the ciphertext and this operation refreshes the noise so if you get if you have a ciphertext with this amount of noise after bootstrapping maybe the noise is really really small but the downside of this is that bootstrapping is Pretty expensive in practice for now. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about uh, how we can apply homomorphic encryption on the blockchain. And for this, we the first question that we have to ask ourselves is why why would you like why should I use homomorphic encryption on the blockchain? Well, by design, the blockchain is publicly verifiable. So uh, this means that there are some privacy concerns. So people, yeah, and privacy concerns uh, in the form of uh, maybe uh, the amounts that we exchange on the blockchain. So th this is all public information and who send uh, money to whom? This is all public information, and this these concerns have been addressed in the Bitcoin model of the blockchain uh, in works like Monero, Zero Coin, and Zero Cash. Uh, and these solutions don't seem to be as good for uh, the account-based model, which you can think of it as Ethereum. Uh, there are works in uh, this model as well, like Hoff and Ikiden, but uh, they have they have some drawbacks, like they are not fully decentralized, and they might be too expensive for some simple operations. Um, and there are also some proposals uh, again in the account-based model, like uh, Zephyr or Smart FHE or the thing that uh, Zama is doing, and uh, ZStar, which I'm not really familiar with, but. And what we are going to do is just follow a simple example from Zither to get a rough idea of how these things are applied on the blockchain. But before, uh, before doing this, I would like to recall what the Ethereum transaction looks like, like really fast. Did I start at uh, 12? Oh, three -ish. Okay. <coughs> Maybe I should move to curve. Yeah. Okay, so uh, on the Ethereum uh, on the Ethereum network, we basically have two types of accounts, uh, like regular users and smart contracts, and there are also the miners who do all the hard work. Uh, and what's important here is that uh, each account in the Ethereum network is uh, specified by the uh, public address and the secret key if you are a regular user and the balance. And there are also other stuff of information like the nonce. Uh, but 
and just a people. So every account is just a pair of public and secret key and the balance. And uh, in the smart contracts, uh, there is no secret key, but you can have both right. And also smart contracts like that. And for instance, if user A wants to send the user B for Ethereum, he has to make up a file that looks something like this. This is called the transaction. We have to specify uh, uh, who is the sender, who we want to send the money to, or the amount. And really important, in the Ethereum network, you can send messages. So one users can, can send both money and information. This is important. Uh, and at the end of the file, you have to open this transaction. And then you just broadcast it to the network. And eventually, your transaction reaches the miners, and uh, the miners will uh, check if your transaction is valid, that the signature is okay, and other stuff. And they count the state of the, they update the state of the accounts. And in the end, uh, one of those miners who did all the work is chosen to basically append the mega block in the block in the blockchain. And basically, the same thing, or almost the same thing, uh, is happening when uh, a regular user talks to a smart contract. But on top of that, uh, the code specified in the smart contract can be wrong. So. And I'll try to explain the basic idea in Zither. Oh, Z Zither is just a smart contract that uh, basically let, let uh, users uh, exchange uh, amounts of Ethereum, but in an encrypted way. So how, this, how does this work? Uh, well, you have to set up a Zither account, and this basically means that we each user generates a homomorphic encryption key pair. And uh, he just sends, to set up an account, he, he sends the public homomorphic encryption key to the smart contract and also the amount with, uh, that he wants to de deposit in uh, Zeta. Uh, and this is basically, in this way, he sets up uh, an encrypted account, so to speak. And uh, the account is uniquely determined by the public key, and the balance is always encrypted. Uh, and once we have uh, such a set setup, uh, obviously you can also add money to this encrypted account. So if you already have a setup, if you want to send more money to your account, uh, then you can do this. Just uh, send the smart contract, the amount you want to add, and specify the public key. and because of the homomorphic properties of the scheme, uh, the smart contract can just add this uh, value to your already encrypted balance. But one thing to notice is that uh, the amount that you send to the Zither smart contract, contract is always public. So when you, when you uh, send money to Zither, anyone knows. So anyone knows how much money uh, you, you send to the smart contract. This is not really, I mean, it's, it could be an issue, but if the community that uses Zither is sufficiently large, then you, you get some kind of anonymity, uh, not anonymity, privacy on your, sorry, on your transactions. And obviously it would be really useless if you could not convert back uh, your uh, Zither tokens to Ethereum. So you can do that as well. Um, to recover, to recover your, uh, uh, or to reclaim your Ethereum from your encrypted balance, you basically have to prove to the smart contract that you know the secret key of the account. So your, your account is specified by the public key, and you say to the smart contract, you, you do a non-interactive zero knowledge proof, where you say that you basically know the secret key. And once the smart contract 
uh, check this. Uh, then he can he can re reimburse you, and also he updates the state of the encrypted balance. And again, this is possible because of the homomorphic properties of the uh, schema. And finally, uh, you can do transfer some data. And uh, for instance, you want to send money from right to left. Uh, what the user on the right does, he encrypts an amount uh, with his public key and uh, the destination public key, he encrypts the same amount and provides zero knowledge proof that uh, proof that the same amount has been uh, encrypted in, in both ciphertext and that the ciphertext are, are well formed and that the balance is sufficiently large to. Uh, to support this transfer. And uh, once this is done, um, the user sends these two ciphertexts to the smart contract together with the, the proof. And the proof verifies the proof, and if the proof uh, passes, then uh, the balances are updated. And again, this is uh, where the homomorphic properties uh, are used. Uh, no, sorry, if you notice, but uh, in this simple example, we only use the fact that the homomorphic scheme is additive, right? I only did additions and subtractions, I didn't use multiplication. And uh, what the other works are exploiting, like uh, Gamma and RTPG, they actually use multiplication as well to get more functionality. Uh, in the smart contracts. So, for instance, Zama is claiming that uh, you can, a simple application, uh, they can compare the balances, so uh, balances in a private way. So, you have two encrypted balances, and in the end, you each one gets to know who has more money. Not sure if this is very useful, but at least people can feel good about themselves. Okay. Uh, four options as well, yeah. And actually, yeah, these are uh, one of the uh, applications of Zeta is uh, seal bid options. Uh, yeah. Uh, if you find these ideas interesting, we can talk further uh, in the break. Thanks. Thank you very much, Fernando. That was a very interesting talk. So yes, if I can hand over to the questions, if you want to. Um, are there also um, methods for string operations? Like not additional multiplication, but let's say string concatenation. String string substitution. You can you can express concatenation, I guess, as a addition and the with the one addition and one multiplication. But yeah yeah the uh, i'm not sure if I, i'm not aware of uh, of a scheme that it's really optimized for concatenation and stuff like that but you you can express concatenation <laughs> <laughs> maybe is this is this one running or <laughs> okay yeah Yeah. This this is what is currently done. Yeah, it's on, it's basic arithmetic on integers. There's also a scheme that does arithmetic on floating points. The CKKS. It's it's in the have some references. Yeah, it's it, uh, you can find the references in the slides. <laughs> 